Good morning. You guys ready to worship? We're not going to wait for them. Let's all stand. Lord, we are so thankful to be here in this beautiful place, Lord. Such a wonderful presence. We worship you, Lord. We ask for your anointing, that you would anoint our voices and our hearts, Lord, that we could stand in your presence and worship you together. In Jesus' name. search the world but it couldn't fill me a man that be praise and treasures that fade are never enough you came along put me back together and every day
the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. And 
out homes that they can choose. How great is the hope that lives in you. The passion that tore through hell like a rose. The promise that rolled back death and its stone. If freedom is worth
You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. In the darkness, my God. 
Amen. That is who you are, Lord. For us, for the whole world, promise keeper. You've made promises that you keep. You're the miracle worker. Only you can do miracles, Lord. In each of our lives, you do miracles. We thank you. We give glory to you, Lord. We pray that you would be glorified in all that we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Say hello to somebody around you. him in a little while, but I think he's doing well. Good morning, family. Saw you guys all fellowshipping so beautifully. I wanted to give you a little bit of extra time, not just jump right into it. It's wonderful to stand down here and see it. Well, we've got a few announcements this morning, but I want to start with uh, the one that Definitely requires prayer and uh, agreement from the body. Uh, our brother Dan Zertucci went to be with the Lord yesterday after a long battle. And uh, in the first service, we already prayed and asked the Lord to offer his peace and comfort to the family. But um, now that you're all here, I want to ask the Lord for that again so that you can all agree with the rest of us in that. So if you would please bow your heads. Father, again, we thank you so much for this beautiful day today, for your breath of life in our lungs. I ask you, Lord, that in light of this information, Lord, that you would help us, encourage us through this, not to take any day for granted, but to wake up each day and thank you for it, for your mercy. And ask you what you have for us to lead us, guide us, Lord. Father, I ask you again with the rest of our family that's here now, Lord, that you would comfort and offer your peace. Just let it rain down upon the Zertucci family and the Thomases. They would just sense your palpable presence, Lord, in their life, in their homes. That they would be comforted with your word, your promises, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you for your word that says that to be absent from the body is to be present with you. Help us to look forward to that as well and not see death as the end. But the beginning of the fulfillment, the manifestation of your promise of eternal life. Pray that each one of us would be open and willing to be a vessel of encouragement to one another in these difficult, challenging times, Lord. That there would be peace beyond understanding within this body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
I want to invite at this point uh, Stephanie Minnick to come up. There she is. Share with us about the women's retreat coming up in a couple weeks. Good morning, everyone. Like Thomas said, I'm Stephanie Minnick, and I'm making a quick little plug for the ladies' retreat. This year it is October 15th through 17th, so coming up in just a few weeks. And it will be at Christian Beret, just up the hill. The theme is joy for the journey. And how many of us feel like we could use some joy for the journey right now in life? I know I can. Um, the deadline, not the deadline, but you're encouraged to sign up by October 3rd, which is next Sunday. And this year, we are going to be having women from our congregation sharing their journey in Christ. Those women include Karen Ross. Um, Caitlin, Thomas's wife, Caitlin, will be sharing, Alex Everhart, and Renee Schuster. Along with these speakers, there'll be different workshops we're going to be doing, games, um, and other fun fall activities. And I personally am really excited for this retreat. I have young children, and I'm expecting more. Um, <laughs> so I'm like really looking forward to time away with the Lord when it's, I'm in a season of life that it's just difficult to find quiet time. So I'm like really, really excited for this retreat. So if you are a husband, husbands, raise your hand, and you have a wife that is here, young, old, any age, you need to encourage them, go to this retreat. Don't worry about the kids. I've got it covered, Right. So husbands, walk your wives up to the sign-up table afterwards, sign them up, bless them in this way, bless your family in this way. Women, encourage your friends to sign up. I know some people have never been to retreats. Encourage people to come. It is such a blessing. It's such a joy to get away um, just from everything. Even though it's just up the hill, it feels like you're getting away. Um, to spend time with the Lord. And I know that I've really been ministered to throughout my life at different retreats. So sign up. That's my encouragement to you. Please feel welcome. There'll be ladies up on the patio afterwards. If you have any questions, please ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Let's see here. Um, okay, so tonight... There is no um, body ministry, our Sunday evening services that we've begun again recently. There, there won't be that service this evening. Uh, it begins at 6, but there will be the men's prayer at 5 p.m. And I believe we're still, I think you'll be able to find us, but they'll either be down here in this group of benches here or up in the fellowship hall, are the two places that we've generally been meeting. Um, going forward... On the second and the fourth Sunday of every month, that Sunday evening service that we've recently begun again will, that's how it'll go forward. So coinciding with the men's prayer meeting at 5 p.m., that'll lead right into the 6 p.m. service on Sunday evenings. And it is, we call it body ministry because it's not just a Bible study. There is the Word. Pastor Miles does uh, go into the Word and give a teaching for us to have a foundation to go off of. But then there's time of worship and prayer, and just praising and worshiping the Lord in whatever way the Spirit moves us to do so. And I'll tell you, last Sunday was, on well, the Sunday before that too, they were phenomenal, such a blessing. Um, so I want to encourage anybody, everybody, to go to those, the second and fourth Sunday of each month. There is children's child care also. At that, I just in case I didn't mention that there is childcare on the Sunday evening service or during it, starting at 6 p.m. Um, we have a tithe box so that when we're meeting out here, we bring tithe box down here, and there's also one up at the top of the path there. If you don't, if you can't find it, you can ask somebody. If you feel led to offer or tithe or anything, then that's where that's where they are. Um, and I want to, the junior high, you guys, in case you haven't been here for the new meeting place down in the, the lighthouse, which is the old pump house at the turn of the driveway coming up, meet Jason and Molly up at the top of the path here, right outside the foyer, where the check-in for the children's ministry is at, and then they'll lead you down the path. 
<laughs> and high schoolers, you're staying with, well, we are staying here today because we have a guest speaker, uh, Brother Ryan Patrick here, and I really want you guys to hear what he has to share. So, Ryan, thank you. Good morning. I'm blessed to be here and sharing this morning. I want to start off by just um, expressing my deepest gratitude for the 10 years of support that you have given to my family in the gospel ministry in South America. And I want to thank you for their continued support as we transition back into the United States. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Judges chapter 7. We're going to read the whole chapter. Then I will make some comments on it. And while you're turning there, let me just start off by saying I, I love the first question of the Westminster Catechism. I keep going back to it and meditating on it and just chewing on it and trying to digest it. It asks, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him. And I, I say, Lord, that's, that's what I want. I just want to, to glorify You. But how can that happen in the state that I'm in? I'm weak. I'm fearful. I'm overwhelmed. How can I do that? But the Lord has been graciously showing me examples in his word to, to flood my soul with encouragement. And I pray that you would be encouraged this morning as well. Let's read Judges chapter 7 and, and then we'll pray. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp in Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of them knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go every man to his home. So people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance and their camels without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread trembled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down so the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given him into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped 
And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all the men and empty jars and torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon... And the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp, beginning of the middle of the watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah, towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel, Meholah, by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers through all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barra and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barra and also the Jordan. And they captured two, the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeeb they killed at the winepress of Zeeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would speak to our hearts now. Prepare us for what it is that you would have us receive. We want to hear from you. We don't want to hear from man. We don't want man's opinion. We want to know what your word says. So, Lord, any word that comes out of my mouth that is not of you, strike it from our hearing. But any word that is of you, we ask that your spirit apply it to our lives that we leave this place changed. Help us be doers of the word, not hearers only. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. What is the chief end of man? As the catechism asks. We are meant to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But when I picture what it means to glorify God, Uh, sometimes I don't picture what that looks like in the living of my life. When when I picture uh, living a life that that glorifies God, I I think of David in in 1 Samuel 17. This this young punk boy stepping forward and his brothers don't even want him there. And he's like, "Why, why are you guys all freaked out over this Goliath cat? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's talking of the people of God like that. Who does this clown think he is? If you won't do anything, I will. I've taken on bears. You don't think I can handle this dog? David just steps forward with this foundation of of faith and confidence. He knew that no one gets to stand up against the God of heaven and get away with it. And David didn't go out convinced in himself. He went convinced that God was going to help. And I look at a man like that, and I look at those circumstances, and I I look at that faith, and I look at that strength, and I look at that confidence, and I say, yeah, that is a man glorifying God. And I look at me, and I look at the state of my heart, and, and maybe you can do the same right now, and ask, do I look anything like David? Am I that Christian that just is full of confidence that I will take on anything? My my knees never buckle, my voice never cracks, my faith never wavers. Whatever the Lord puts in front of me, I just go out and do. Oh God, I wish. God, I wish I was like that. See, on the one hand, I give thanks that the Bible is filled with these stories of of faith and courage. 
We need that. We need the Lord to point us to something higher and, and something truer. We need in that moment of doubt to realize there was something as that little punk boy standing in a field across from someone who should have wiped him out. And yet God came through. We need that. But at the same time, God's word doesn't just speak with that voice of confidence, that voice that says, oh, of course you're going to be up for it. Of course your faith will never waver. God is so gracious. He doesn't just give us Davids. He gives us Gideons. Now, one thing we have to remember when we look at Gideon, we, we have to remove a whole bunch of legends. And, and one of those legends when it comes to Gideon, is that Gideon was this fierce and faithful, mighty warrior of God. Yet when we read his account, it's like story upon story upon story is trying to make the exact opposite point. So God gives us a glimpse into what it means to glorify him when you are not strong. What does it mean to glorify God when you're weak? I thank God Gideon is here because he preaches in a way that I need to hear. In chapter 7, we really see the story taking shape. This is where it gets really famous. I suppose the, the fleece is, is pretty famous, but this is the grand finale. This is what everybody's waiting for when they hear the story of Gideon. This is what we're looking for. But, but notice in these first nine or so verses what God is doing. God is putting together his weak army. And the first two verses of this chapter are the key. The first two verses define the theme that the whole chapter submits to. It's the defining theme of God's glory. And so the people have answered Gideon's call, and when reading Gideon's life, you see that that in itself was a, done by the help of God. The power of God went forward, and the people who wanted to kill Gideon now rise up and follow him. And so an army assembles. But God takes one look at this army and says, you know what? It's too big. Nobody looks at their army the night before a battle and says, it's too big. Yeah, that, that's too big. Let, let's, let's just scale back. You would think someone would be saying, the Midianite army is too big. And, and God goes, no, 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 no. The Israelite army is too big. And Gideon's probably going, what? What are you talking about? God too big? But God isn't looking at this as Gideon is looking at this. He's looking at it so differently because he has a reason. And he says the reason why this army is too big. Look, look at verse 2. Lest Israel boast, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now there are two things you have to understand about that kind of reason. The one is it is a pillar across the entire Bible. And we must live by this. God must be glorified. It's not nice if God gets glorified. It's not good if God gets glorified. No, he must be glorified. And this is one of those ideas that really alienates humanity. We have a problem with this. It's, it's unnatural to us. Because if I said, I must be glorified, you would say, no, you don't, and you're really full of it if you think you should be. It's actually a mark of sin and self-obsession if we ever thought that we should be glorified. If, if, if any of us stood up here and said, you know what, I'm the most important person in this amphitheater, you would say, you have a major pride problem going on. But what we have to realize is that illustration breaks down with God. God is not just merely the most important person in this amphitheater. He is the most important person person in all of creation. There is no one as important as God. We can't say that about us. 
But it's absolutely true of God. And if God is the most important person in all of creation, I mean, he created creation, right? It's actually right. It's actually fitting that God is glorified. Now picture the opposite. God goes, I'm going to share this glory. That would be wrong because no one deserves God's glory. There is no one who can say, I am worthy of being praised. It would be wrong if God ever got off that throne. It would be wrong if God ever shared that glory. There is no one in the category of God with God. And so this is that principle that's going on everywhere in scriptures and in creation. And it is that God must be glorified. He deserves it. He said through the prophet Isaiah, when talking about why he's merciful to him, he says it so clearly, for my own sake. For my own sake I do it, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. That is not selfish. That is not self-obsessed. That is right. It's absolutely, perfectly right. God must be glorified. This is the dominant principle going on. And and what you find is that it's so important to to God that he is going to delay saving Israel until that gets worked out. In other words, God's glory is more important than salvation. God comes first. So there they are with their, their army. We finally got everything together. God, let's go smoke these and God says, hold up, hold up, we're going to get this glory thing right before we take another step. God's glory is preeminent. God's glory is the most important thing going on. God's glory is what you are meant to live for. What is your chief end? To glorify him. That's the first thing you have to understand. But, but the second thing, it, it goes right along with it. God must be glorified, but humanity tries to steal God's glory, which doesn't say much about us, does it? God must be glorified, but humanity tends to try to steal God's glory. God looks at Israel and he says, and, and he knows, he knows their hearts. And he says, if, if you guys can take any credit for any part of this, you will. You will go and sing your songs and and praise yourselves for that one thing that you did. Even if God did 99% of the work, you will go home and praise yourself for the 1%. God knows his people. He knows their glory thieves. And they have a habit of stealing the glory that only belongs to God. So he looks at this army. 32,000 strong, that's a good size. He says, this army's too big. You will take credit if you win this with this army. You will say, we fought so well. We, we were so mighty. We were so strong. So God is not going to let Israel steal the glory that only belongs to him. So he has this solution that only God could have. Why don't we weaken this army that has been put together? And then God alone will get the glory. He's going to make this army so small that no one can take credit for the victory that's about to come. And so you pick up the text in in verse 3. God starts chopping away at the numbers. God says whoever is fearful can leave, which is a gracious and practical provision under the law, Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. And so at the end of the verse, there's there's only an army of 10,000 deep. But can you imagine in the moment, 32,000 down to 10,000? 22,000 men looked around and said, yeah, I'm fearful. I want to go home. I'm a man, and and I I don't ever want to admit fear or show fear. And here's 22,000 men who say, yeah, you know what? We can't hang. 
10,000 that remain must have been men among men. But you know, there is a difference between being brave and just being dumb. Right? They lost two-thirds of their army. And now they're kind of stuck. They can't go, you know what? Second thought, I changed my mind. I'm out of here too. But then it even gets worse because God's not done. Look there in verse 4. He says, there are still too many. So God has another round of cuts. Those who lapped the water made the team. Those who knelt down didn't make the team. The army started with 32,000. God shrinks it down to 10,000. Gideon must have been so discouraged. Then God says, there's There's still too many. And at this point, Gideon's heart must have just sunk. What do you mean, too many? You just sent home two-thirds of my crew, and God's like, it's okay. I'll I'll test them for you. Gideon's probably, I don't want you to test them. I want you to add to them. So God cuts the army down to 300 people. From a worldly perspective, this is (laughs) just getting absurd. We went from 32,000 down to 300. God just dismissed like 99% of the army. God, what are you doing? God, we had 32,000. God. From Gideon's view, from a worldly perspective, this is just bizarre. It's absurd. But from God's perspective, this was just right. Because when this army triumphs, God will be the only person who gets the glory. So we got God's weak army, but before we even get to use that weak army, we get one more experience with God's weak servant. Look there in verse verse 9. The same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. God tells Gideon, victory is assured. You will win this, Gideon. Why will you win? Because God has got this. The victory is assured. But this is, this is just the grace of God. Knowing what we know about Gideon, how do you think he feels the night before battle? Um, probably freaked out. That's a good description. He's been afraid constantly since chapter 6 when we're introduced to him. At, and, and at this point, on, on the one hand, we tend to say, oh, Gideon, you should have had stronger faith. But he did just lose like 99% of his army. He's supposed to lead what is left into the battle the next day. Gideon is afraid. And God knows it. And again, this is just the grace of God. Couldn't have God have said, why are you so afraid, Gideon? Who are you to lead my army? Why don't you trust me yet? Don't you have faith yet? Haven't you seen everything I've done for you? But God doesn't say any of that. Gideon, if you're afraid, I've got a sign for you. Go to the other army, listen to what they say. God has been so good and gracious in the story of Gideon. How many promises does God need to make to Gideon? How many signs does Gideon need confirming the same promise? And yet, here God is again. You put out a fleece asking for signs that you should have never asked for. God graciously gave them. Here you are again, hearing the promise of God. God saying, I am going to deliver you into their hand. And again, God gives him another sign. On any occasion, God's word was good enough. God's word is good enough. But he looks at his servant. He knows he's afraid. He knows whom he has chosen. He knows this man. God did not play the lottery and just randomly get this 
this guy. He chose Gideon. God chose the man from the start who was hiding. God chose the man he knew was reluctant. God chose the man he knew was fearful. God chose the man he knew was doubting. God knew it. He says, if you're afraid, P.S., I know you're afraid. I have a sign for you. Go to the enemy's camp. And the text picks up and tells us about the enemy soldiers telling about the dream and the interpretation and how God was going to deliver Midian into the hands of the Israelites. And when Gideon hears this, in verse 15, it tells us Gideon worshiped. And he goes back to his camp and tells the remaining soldiers, Arise, the Lord has given us the victory. Gideon hears God's confirmation. This is probably Gideon's most wonderful moment. He worshiped. He hears the grace of God. He hears God's promise. And he worships the God who has brought him this far. And Gideon comes back to camp, a transformed man. And this is as good as it, as it gets for him. We're, we're not going to get into all that. But he, but he comes back to the camp, a transformed and strengthened man. He is a man who goes from doubt and fear. And he looks at his soldiers and says, Arise, God has given us the victory. Get up. Let's do this. And it must have been so sincere so heartfelt. He rallies the troops, all, all 300 of them, and they're ready to go take on this army that covers the hills like locusts, with, like camels without numbers. He rallies them to go forward and take hold of the promises of God. So on the one hand, we have God's weak army. and In the other, we have God's combined with God's weak servant. And when they triumph, God will be the only one who gets glory. And so we move into the climax of, of the story from, from verse 16 to the rest of, of the chapter. We see God's glorious victory. We, we read it, and if, if you know the story, think about how good of a plan this is. Gideon divides his 300 men into three groups. He gives them all trumpets and empty jars with torches. He tells them to blow the trumpet and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. How good of a plan is that? Gideon's already outnumbered. It doesn't appear that, that God gave Gideon this plan. So maybe it's like Gideon goes, hey, I got this idea. Trumpets. But not only that, I want you to have a pot. But wait, put a torch in the pot. Trumpet, pot, torches. We got this. We'll break into three groups. We'll blow our trumpets. Oh, and one more thing, shout for the Lord. That is good. But then he adds something. Look, look at the end of, of verse 18. And for Gideon. For the Lord and Gideon. The whole point of the chapter, remember verse 2? Lest you guys boast, saying my own hand has saved me. I'm not really sure adding your name to the battle cry helps God's purpose. This could have been innocent enough. But if you know how the story of Gideon is going to proceed, I think the author of, the, of Judges is, is foreshadowing where Gideon is about to go in his life. We're not going to go there. We get to just cover the happy part. In the rest of the chapter, God gives the victory. It, it's amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing victory. Let, let's try to work this out. Let me, let me try to walk through this. I, I give these 300 men props because they follow Gideon's uh, orders to the letter. I mean, the, these guys were soldiers. These, these were, this were loyalty. They play their trumpets. They light their torches. They break their jars, and they yell at the enemy. And see, this is the part, by the way, where Gideon's plan just took this huge leap of faith because they do all that and they stand there. 
The text says, actually says, they just stood there. Verse 21. That could have gone poorly, right? We're going to a much larger army, stronger army. We're going to wake them up. We're going to yell at them. They could have woken up, grabbed their swords, ran after Gideon. And in that line of thinking, if I have a, a trumpet in one hand and a torch in another hand, what don't I have in my hand? A sword? A shield? The text doesn't say if they had him or not, but the text does say they had a torch in their hand and a, shield, a, a trumpet in their hand, and they stood there. And they wake up the army and just waited to see what was going to happen. That could have gone horrible. But God, but God in this wonderful moment, that fear that he had poured upon the, the Midianite army had been on all of them. They're, they're terrified of, of Gideon and, then, and his army in the middle of the night shouting and trumpets and they hear the name they've been fearing for the Lord and for Gideon. And then God just has this terror descend on them. And, and it's truly like, they go, they, they go insane, some flee, some turn on each other. It's a wild scene. And then Gideon, for like the very first time, actually takes some initiative because he sees them running away. He, he sends out the call, and everybody rallies, and they wipe out Midian. So we have God's weak army, and the weak servant, and they combine to form this glorious victory. And who gets the glory? Who's going to share in the glory that day? No one gets the glory except God. God alone. God loves working through weakness. He must get a special delight in working through weakness. Because you see this theme throughout the scriptures. You, you see this all across God's plans. It was a despised Messiah, born to poor parents, who his people rejected to, to the point of executing him, of, of crucifying him in the end. It is an imperfect church with imperfect people preaching a message that the world considers foolishness. It is weak and fearful disciples like us who God in his unimaginable wisdom is called to be ambassadors of his kingdom. But God's unlikely plans are filled with his glory because that crucified Savior rose. That crucified Savior rose like a conquering lion. That church is going to march unstoppably forward until the end of the age because of all those weak ambassadors like you and me. God is going to show his strength in us. And we're going to continue going forward and doing his work in his power. Sometimes we rule ourselves out. Sometimes we think we're too weak to really bring glory to God. We're too fearful to bring glory to God. God, I, I'm no David. I would be one of those hiding from Goliath. So we look at ourselves and we say, how? How, how is that supposed to be me? How am I the one to, to glorify God? How, how am I supposed to do that? I know I'm supposed to do that. I know the chief end of man is to glorify God. How am I to do that? God, there is nothing glorious coming out of my life right now. I have no idea how weak, fearful, doubting me is supposed to glorify 
almighty God. How's that supposed to be me? But why did God choose Gideon? Why, why did God choose Gideon knowing that he was fearful? Knowing that he was doubting? Knowing that he was weak? He did it on purpose. He chose that doubting, weak, fearful man on purpose because God was especially glorified through Gideon because Gideon is not all that great. Church, why did he choose us? Why did he choose us? The answer has to be the same. He did it on purpose. Sometimes we think our weakness rules us out from glorifying and serving God. But Gideon reminds us our weakness actually might be exactly what makes us good at glorifying and serving God. Do you feel weak today? Does your life make you feel weak? Your circumstances make you feel weak? Your job, your school, does your health make you feel weak? Have you ever considered that you are weak for the glory of God? Have you ever considered that your weakness is God's glorious design for you? Have you ever considered that your weakness is in fact your most powerful means in glorifying God? That all that makes you feel like you are at the end of The rope that you are at the end of your strength actually makes you good at glorifying God. When it comes to God's glory, your weakness is not the problem. When it comes to God's glory, your strength is the problem. Because it's your so-called strength that makes you wake up in the morning and think you don't need God's word. It's your so-called strength that makes you get up in the morning and think, I can face the day without prayer. It's your so-called strength that makes you think you don't need God's wisdom in his word or with his people when they are gathered so you don't show up to church. It's your so-called strength at the end of the day makes you think you get a little bit of credit for what God is doing in and through your life. It's your so-called strength that makes you a glory thief. You know, people are not meant to think that you're a big deal. People are meant to think that your God is a big deal. And you know what broadcasts that more than anything? Weakness. Over the past, um, especially three months, you know, um, stepping down from ministry, relocating my family to a whole new culture, I've felt weak. God has been breaking me and humbling me. And I woke up this morning In church, I confess, I felt weak. I'm terrified to come into the pulpit. I haven't taught in several months, and I look at the word, and I go over my notes. I go, I don't have this in me. I don't know how to do this. And I just had to smile and thank God for continuing to show me my weakness on the morning that I'm going to teach on weakness. You know what? Sometimes we face the world, and we think, I don't have it in me. I don't know how to do it. I don't have it in me. I'm too weak. And and you know what? I don't think God expects you to repent of your weakness. God knows you're weak. He knows who you are. He knows who he has chosen. 
He knows your frame. He knows you are but dust. Our weakness is God-given. Our weakness is God-designed. Designed for what? That doesn't help me, Ryan. You know what helps me? is when I feel good. What helps me is when I feel strong. You know what helps me is when I feel like I have it all together. And God says, helps you for what? Does it help you glorify him? Or does it help you take a little bit of that glory? Our dependence, our dependence on God's faithfulness, it, sh- it shows his faithfulness in a way that our strength never could. Our fear, Gideon's fear, shows God's kindness in a way that our courage couldn't. The the Apostle Paul would preach, his strength is made perfect in weakness. I believe God wants us convinced of something this morning. He wants you convinced that you can do absolutely nothing good apart from him. And God wants then that conviction of our hearts to be broadcast to the world. When people look at you, they're not to think, oh, you're a big deal. They are to think he or she serves a great God. That person is actually kind of a mess. But look at how God upholds them. Look how good their God is to them. The world is meant to see that you are dependent upon God. So that in the end, there will be no doubt that God alone gets the glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your strength. God, I don't want my own strength. I want your strength perfected in me. Help me have your perspective on every situation. Help us be dependent upon you. Help us be Christians who glorify you in our God-given weaknesses so that there's no doubt we are yours and you are ours. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Let's all stand. You are God in heaven and here am I on earth. So I'll let my words be few Jesus, I am so in love with you And I stay Yes, I stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. Yes, I stand in awe of you, Jesus. Yes, I stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. Jesus, I am so in love with you.
Jesus, I am so in love with you. God bless your day.